Welcome to the WRAL Daily Download. I'm your host, Amanda Lamb. In today's deep dive conversation with WRAL's hidden history reporter, Heather Leah, we're talking about Juneteenth and what the first days of freedom in Raleigh looked like. Heather, welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me. So we know that Juneteenth is a federal holiday. It's celebrated on June 19th. It's the only, uh, the third year that it's been celebrated as a federal holiday. But obviously, the history goes much, much deeper. Um, Tell us just briefly what it commemorates and also how Raleigh has honored this day for a very long time. Yeah, so essentially, I I think many people are starting to know by now, but Juneteenth, in a very brief explanation, was the day that freedom uh, first came to Texas. Uh, Union troops reached Texas, and essentially what was happening was a lot of the uh, plantation owners weren't wanting to actually free the people they had enslaved, even though the Emancipation Proclamation had legally freed them. So the Union troops had to actually go through to different states and actually make uh, the plantation owners free the people that they had enslaved. And Juneteenth celebrates the specific date that this happened in Texas. And then Raleigh had something called Emancipation Day, right, that they also celebrated on their own. Um, and that started mm-hmm. in, what, 1870? Yeah, Emancipation Day, um, it, it's a similar uh, similar celebration in that it was celebrating the day of the Emancipation Proclamation. So that's what they were celebrating in Raleigh. And this holiday celebration did specifically happen in Raleigh. Um, I spoke to um, Preservation North Carolina, and they're centered in one of the Freedmen's Villages that are still standing today um, that were that was built uh, by people who were freed from slavery here in, here in the city. And, you know, so this was a day, but obviously uh, June 19th, uh, 1865 was just the beginning. Thousands of people were emancipated and they came to Raleigh. Um, it was a whole generation of free families. Where did they go and what did they do? Yeah, so um, a lot of the families, you got to imagine, these are people who up until this point did not really have access to their own money. They weren't allowed to have an education. They weren't allowed to have a job. They weren't. They didn't necessarily have their own church buildings or their own school buildings. Um, they essentially had to build a life and a community from from nothing or almost nothing, whatever they were allowed to have while enslaved. Um, and there were, according to records, several thousand people who were enslaved in the Raleigh area. Uh, what is currently downtown Raleigh at the time was primarily plantations, right? You would have had the Cameron Plantation, the Devereaux Plantation, the Mordecai Plantation, the Lane Plantation. There was quite a few. Um, so there were a lot of people who were suddenly free. And what do they do? Where do they go? Right? And that's uh, that. essentially what they did was, and this is what I was told by a historian because I asked this question myself. I said, you know, when they were suddenly free, what was the first thing they did? And he told me the first thing they would have done probably is walk off the plantation simply because they could. And then a lot of them had to come back and begin working as sharecroppers uh, to make money uh, on the same plantation where they had been enslaved. And another thing they did was they formed these freedmen's villages. There were 13 of them in Raleigh at the time, only two remain. And I think we're going to talk about those when we come back, right? Absolutely. (laughs) So, yes, much more on that after the break. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. So, Heather, before the break, we were talking about these freedmen's villages. I mean, it's so fascinating to me how you describe the fact that they walked off the plantation and then they had to walk back on as sharecroppers so they could make money, so they could start a life because they had nothing at this point. Mm -hmm. So how did they go about creating these communities? Yeah, you know, um, And I want to be clear, this is history that I've been told by people who live in Raleigh, some who actually have roots going all the way back to these plantations. So I'm sharing what I've been told uh, by people for whom this history is deeply personal. So you suddenly have several thousand people uh, who are free. Uh, Raleigh's population, I think, doubled at the time because of that. 
uh, or population of free people, population that they counted legally, I should say. Um, the population was already there. And these people uh, had no money, no homes, most no formal education. There were no churches, schools, or medical facilities. And these people pulled together, and they brick by brick built 13 freedmen's villages. Two remain today, Oberlin Village and Method. Um, but there were, there were 11 others which have been destroyed by now by development and flooding. Most of these villages... Uh, it's referred to as environmental racism. They were forced to live in the low-lying areas that were likely to flood or over by the junkyard or by the train tracks, anywhere where... There, there were not desirable areas. Correct. And a lot of that is still reflected. If you look at today's Raleigh, you can see some of that reflected. Um, but anyways, they built there. They built churches. We have Shaw University pop up. We have St. Agnes, uh, which was a segregated hospital that provided the highest quality care for the African-American community between Washington, D.C. and New Orleans, right here in Raleigh. Um, You see Central, right? North Carolina Central University, um, Shaw University. So a lot of these places started to be built. Oberlin Village, which is still standing today, gives us a good view of what it might have looked like. They built churches. A lot of those historic churches are still standing. Um, And these places started to thrive. They built businesses, and and they really started to make money. And for a while, they were able to even represent in government. Um, These communities were, were thriving. And then other things happened during the Jim Crow era to kind of push some of them back down again and try to Uh, make sure that they couldn't thrive as much. But I mean, I think it's so important to understand then when you look at the history of Juneteenth that some people might think, oh, this is a, a, it's a new holiday. Mm. It is a new federal holiday, but in terms of what it represents to people and certainly what it represents to all the people in this community and other communities like our community, it, it was a beginning. It was a beginning. Emancipation Day, which again was what we celebrated in Raleigh or what the the African-American community celebrated in Raleigh, Um, they had parades, uh, they had uh, choirs come out and sing, and it was a very contemplative day where the community would come together and they would basically brainstorm on what they could do as the black community to build the Raleigh that they wanted. So when I look at Emancipation Day, which is sort of the, the Raleigh the, the more localized version of Raleigh what we celebrated version, here, right? right? Um, it, it was a celebration, but also contemplation. And it was very focused on being a community, keeping your community strong, and working together in a way that you don't often see people do, right? Um, I spoke to one historian who told me, I mean, these people work together to, to build something incredible because, I mean, that's... That's what they had to do to survive. Uh, right. And what was their choice? They didn't really have a choice. They were, like you said, they were free, but they had nothing. And so they had to start from the ground up. Yeah. As a historian, why do you think it's so important for us to understand the history behind this holiday? Mm. So I will say I, I've heard a lot of people who don't fully understand the context of the history say things like, oh, the Civil War, that was a long time ago. It's not really causing problems today. Why are people still talking about it? I think when you really understand everything that was done to the African-American community, uh, even after emancipation, during Jim Crow, or the places that they had to live, and also look at how how they flourished and thrived despite the pressures being put on them, uh, it's incredible to look at, but it's also you need to look at it and understand that some of the issues that we're seeing here today are ripple effects from that. So there's some context there that's really important to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for explaining, you know, the history behind this important holiday. And if you are interested in finding out more about Juneteenth and celebrations, you can go to WRAL.com. If you're listening to this podcast on WRAL.com or the WREL app, you can also find it on any podcast app. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, pretty much anywhere podcasts live. You'll find more episodes of the WREL Daily Download. Thanks for listening.